Good morning, everyone. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for us to discuss uh, this super important Supreme Court case that uh, finds itself at the center of the slavery and abolition and westward expansion of slavery debate. And that is the Dred Scott case. So uh, if you ever find yourself uh, having been nominated by the president for a position as an associate justice on the Supreme Court. And someone from Congress says, name for me the worst Supreme Court decision of all time. There are a number of choices from which you can choose, but you could never go wrong saying Dred Scott. And the reason for that is this is a Supreme Court case that if you connect the dots, almost directly takes us to the Civil War, which is the most destructive and painful war in American history. So let's talk about it. There's Dred Scott. Um, and with so many things that, that come from the Supreme Court, the actual person at hand is really just a, a symbol for uh, a, a larger issue. So while Dred Scott's personal story may be interesting, uh, remember this isn't really about Dred Scott in the same way that the, uh, the Dreyfus affair isn't really about Dreyfus. It's, it's about the issue of slavery. So it's 1857 and this case has been knocking around the courts for a long time. And the question at hand is what happens when an enslaved person goes to a place where slavery is illegal? Is that person still a slave or is that person free? It goes to the very heart of what legal slavery and what legal freedom mean. And it goes a long way in fleshing out this larger paradox in American history. Um, I can't say it more eloquently than Abraham Lincoln did in his House Divided speech. So if you, uh, if you are interested, go and check out Lincoln's House Divided speech. He makes some biblical allegory. Lincoln talks about... Um, just like a, a servant cannot have two masters, just like a person can't have two bosses. Um, a country cannot serve a system that is slave and free at the same time. A country can't be half slave, half free in perpetuity. It's got to be all of one thing or all of the other thing. And th this, this complex legal mess is a consequence of that. You know, in one country, you have two different systems. So people on both sides are itching for the Supreme Court to kind of weigh in on this. So this is a case that's been knocking around the court system for the better part of a decade. And the story is here you have a picture of Dred Scott. Dred Scott is an enslaved person who is the property of an army doctor, a guy by the name of Emerson. And he had traveled to a free territory. So he ends up in what will become the state of Illinois. And then he ends up in the territory of Wisconsin on an army base. And then he returns to Missouri, which is, of course, as part of the Missouri Compromise, was a slave state. And at that point, uh, some friends on his behalf sue in state court and then federal court for his freedom. And their argument is since Dred Scott went to uh, a place where slavery has been disallowed, then by right, he ought to be a free person. Uh, Pro-slavery people will use the metaphor, well, if an animal runs away, say if, you're, if your horse runs out of your yard and goes to your neighbor's yard, well, then your horse doesn't automatically belong to your neighbor. And abolitionists are saying, well, it's, it's more complicated than that. And, and we need to we need the courts to weigh in on this. So this case is, has been bouncing around the federal court system now for for the better part of a decade. Let's talk about some of the key players here. You already know most of them. Um, Lincoln, pre, the man who will eventually become President Abraham Lincoln, who is now a, a candidate for Senate, will kind of derisively refer to these guys as Franklin, Rogers, Stephen, and James. So. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, that's the Chief Justice of the United States, Roger Brooke Tawney. We've seen him before. He was actually the Treasury Secretary for Andrew Jackson 
he was that third treasury secretary during the bank war that, uh, that did Jackson's bidding and took all of the, the deposits out of the second bank of the United States. He is, as you can tell, super old. He is a Marylander and a, uh, a Southerner and a proponent of slavery. Upper right hand corner, that's, that's handsome Frank. That's Franklin Pierce, who is the uh, president of the United States right now while this case is, is being decided or while the case is winding its way through court. And even though he is from New Hampshire, he has Southern sensibilities. And the name we used for people like that, Northerners who are pro-South is a doe face. In the bottom right-hand corner, that is the little giant, that is Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is that politician from Illinois who wants desperately to be president. And he thinks he is going to appease both sides by using the popular sovereignty argument to determine the issue of slavery and its expansion. You know, I don't care if slavery is voted up or down. I just want the people to be able to decide for themselves. And then in the lower left-hand corner, he enters our story, I think for the first time, that's James Buchanan, the only president we've ever had from the state of Pennsylvania. Now, because it's the 21st century and because uh, our generation is hyper obsessed with people's private lives and people's sexual history, if you type James Buchanan into a search engine, uh, invariably the first thing that's going to pop up is James Buchanan president and James Buchanan gay. I don't know if the man was gay or not. It's not something that people talked about in the 19th century, but he is the only president in American history who was uh, never married. So every other president in American history has either been married or a widower. He's the only single guy. He's the only bachelor who remained a bachelor for his entire life. So, uh, these are your characters. James Buchanan is like Franklin Pierce, a doe face from PA. And he is very much in favor of the Supreme court weighing in on this too. Now, he'll do something here that you're not allowed to do. It's dirty. He actually writes to Roger Brooke Taney, and he tries to influence him as to the outcome of this case. So it's like all four of these guys are in collusion to see the Dred Scott case decided in a way that is favorable to the South and with an outcome that makes some statements about the extension of slavery into the territories. So um, Lincoln's metaphor when he talks about it is like these guys, maybe they didn't collude, but they all showed up to a barn raising uh, with, with equal pieces of the barn that just so happened to fit together. And you're probably thinking, Mr. Colton, what's a barn raising? And it doesn't really matter. But these guys have similarly aligned interests in seeing this case uh, decided against Dred Scott. So what was their court? What was the court ruling? What did they get right? What did they, did they get wrong? And how did they make it? So for those of you who are interested in American legal history, or for those of you who are thinking about pursuing a career in constitutional law or in law at all, this is super important. So the court case is Dred Scott v. Sanford. The, the army uh, doctor, Emerson, uh, sold Dred Scott and property rights passed through a number of people. And eventually this guy, Sanford, becomes the, uh, becomes the owner. In a 7-2 decision, they make a very far reaching decision about the Dred Scott case. So they find against Dred Scott. So he is still an enslaved person. He is still property. Now for Dred Scott, it doesn't really matter. Dred Scott is purchased um, by some of his friends and he is freed. He's manumitted. So it has a happy ending for him. Um, he uh, still has descendants that live in the Missouri area today or did as, as late as 2018. So um, he ends his life a free man. So, but again, this isn't about Dred Scott. This is about the, uh, the issue of slavery. So as part of this decision, you know that the Supreme Court can say, lower courts decided this case correctly, but they decided the case correctly based on law that's incorrect or unconstitutional. So 
Roger Brooktani will look at this and say, yeah, the Missouri Compromise itself is unconstitutional. Telling people in a territory that they cannot have slaves before that territory even becomes a state is against the precepts of the Constitution. So the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional. The 1850 Compromise is unconstitutional. Um, the Northwest Ordinance, which is which predates the Constitution, written by Thomas Jefferson, is itself unconstitutional. You cannot tell people that they cannot take their property from one place to another place, because to do so would uh, deprive them of their Fifth Amendment right to due process. Government can't take away your property without legal due process. And the argument here is because slaves are property, they cannot be taken away without uh, without some kind of legal instrument. So this is uh, this is a remarkable decision. And when the South hears this decision, they are um, enormously happy because this represents the possibility for slavery to explode all over the rest of the country. After this decision, free states become the the endangered minority. Slave states will become the the de facto de jure uh, states of the future. Any place will assume to to uh, to be a state that allows uh, or a territory that allows slavery until it votes otherwise. And the South is emboldened after this. You know, people start taking talking again about taking over other parts of Mexico and adding additional slave territory to the country. Let's take over Cuba and add the half million slaves that live in Cuba to the United States. Slave owners in Georgia are, are, are uh, getting emboldened and talk, start talking about marching their slaves up to Massachusetts, to Boston, the epicenter of the abolitionist movement in America, and calling the rolls of their slaves in front of the Bunker Hill Monument. And so this is getting nastier and nastier. But Roger Brooktani doesn't end there. This isn't the extent of his decision. He does something else. When a court issues an obiter dictum, the Supreme Court decides something. And then this is like fancy Latin for, oh, by the way, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the case, but we want to explain our reasoning. So here's something else we're telling you. So go ahead and pause it and just take a second and read it. So what do you think? One of the things that Roger Brooktani is saying here is that Dred Scott did not have standing to bring his case to court. Just like the Cherokee did not have standing to bring their case to court when they sued Andrew Jackson the first time before Wooster versus Georgia. And the reason for that is African Americans, even in places where they are citizens according to state law, are not citizens of the United States of America. So slaves cannot be citizens. And because slaves are not citizens, their ancestors cannot be citizens. So what he's saying here is every single African American in the United States, freedman or slave, is not a citizen under the Constitution. So if you fast forward, not don't fast forward my, my presentation here, but if you were to fast forward in American history, some people wonder why the, um, why the 14th Amendment was necessary in the Constitution, because the 13th Amendment ends the institution of slavery. So once slavery is over, why do we need a separate amendment that say African-Americans are citizens of the United States? Or how come we need an amendment that says that your citizenship rights cannot be taken away from you simply because of your race or ethnicity? And the reason for that is this Supreme Court case. This Supreme Court case establishes a doctrine that slaves cannot be citizens and their ancestors cannot be citizens or their progeny cannot be citizens. And to undo that Supreme Court decision, it required the 14th Amendment. So uh, there is Dred Scott. So it ends okay for him. He ends his life a, a free man. I uh, believe he dies of tuberculosis a few years after uh, the court ruling. But again, it's not about 
Dred Scott. It's about the outcome of Dred Scott. So this is 1857. It emboldens the slavers in the southern part of the country, and it also reinvigorates the abolitionist movement. So what's going to happen in 1858 is this new political party that had run unsuccessfully for president in 1856, the Republican Party, is going to uh, sweep the midterm elections in 1858 and pick up all of these seats in the north. And the Republicans are looking around saying, if we really are the pow- the party of, of anti-slavery and stopping the spread of slaves, there are enough electoral votes just in free states that we can capture the presidency in 1860. We better plan for that. And uh, that's the story of Dred Scott and hope you enjoyed it.